Okay, so today I have a special treat for you. I'm going to walk around my yard starting off early this Friday morning, August the 26th. And we're going to look at pollen and nectar resources that I have right here on my property. Now what we're looking at looks great in the landscape. It's perennial. They grow everywhere. Not great for honeybees, but you'll see other pollinators on them once in a while. It's found all over the northeastern United States. In fact, the whole eastern side of the U.S. The next one here is clover, white clover specifically. So this is white clover and it is considered one of North America's most important nectar plants. Also provides pollen and it spreads out throughout the growing year. So I have clover everywhere where I mow. Clovers produce nectar yielding large quantities of light, mild honey and their enormous commercial appeal because they're good for other things, for forage, for your livestock and things like that. Some other things you could get uh, 200 pounds of surplus honey under optimal conditions and average nectar sugar concentration reported for clover is 22 to 55 percent. This is some low ground cover known as self heal and it can be confused sometimes with dead nettle. Dead nettle has those purple leaves that overlay the top of it. This year is the first time I really noticed my honeybees on it. And I think near the end of uh, this video presentation, we'll see some bees on it as well as bumblebees, honeybees, and of course it's mixed right in with the clover. Great ground cover. Clover doesn't hurt your feet. Don't listen to those chemical companies that want you to get this stuff out of your yards because clover is kind of a long-standing staple for the bees. Now you might be wondering, how come my honeybees aren't cruising around on it right now? Well, because I started this off early in the morning. This is my yard, and uh, there's heavy dew on everything. We had rain. And so I'm showing you different corners of my yard. And when I say my yard, it's eight and a half acres. We have woodlands, meadows, water resources, everything for the bees. And here we have goldenrod in the background. Goldenrod is just coming in, and that's going to be a heavy nectar flow for the bees. We're going to find out that uh, if you're starting beekeeping in the northern United States, you're going to find out goldenrod kicks off a very big nectar flow. And we're just at the leading edge of it here right now. So goldenrod would be considered the most important late season pollinator plant. Honeybees are on them all the time. They get a load of nectar. They get a lot of pollen from it. And it kicks off a late season brood buildup. So people get a lot of honey off of it and this kicks things off, but it creates a strong honey, a darker honey than some of the others. And uh, the good news is it lasts a pretty long time. And what I want to show you today when we're looking around the property is that we have a variety of plants that are in bloom at different times of the year so that the bees don't have a period where they're in dearth. This is my goldenrod field. And of course I have paths going through everything so I can walk through and get close up looks, see what the bees are on, see what they're doing. And of course I do photography as well, but I'm going to introduce you to some species. Goldenrod just comes on its own. I didn't plant it. So it's perennial. It just keeps coming back year after year. And by the end of uh, this video, when I was out walking around looking at things and it dried off a little bit, because this took me several hours actually to walk around and find these things. Uh, it was dry enough that the bees were on it finally. So midday to late afternoon, you would see them all over the goldenrod. So this is Joe Pie Weed. It's also known as butterfly plants. So they have a close relative known as bone set you might have heard of, and it attracts lots of solitary bees as well as bumblebees. I do see honeybees on it from time to time. Probably not a heavy resource for my apiary here, but uh, they're out there and they grow wild again. So at the French Creek watershed, which is not far from me, there are of course lots of patches of Joe Pie weed. And that's kind of the key to finding nectar and pollen resources for your bees. Areas that have high densities of the same flowering plants. That gets your bees attention, foragers go out, they find it, they come back to the beehive. They get other foragers after they've tasted the nectar that's coming from these plants and they bring them out. So all of these plants that I'm showing you are in bloom right now. 
and they're in competition with one another for pollinators because these plants obviously they exist because pollinators cycle back to them and they reward the pollinators with nectar and pollen of course to raise their brood so the nectar is the resource for the energy for the bees they store it they turn it into honey and then here we have a native green wasp i believe and i think that sometimes they're called emerald wasps i would have to look that up but if you wanted to know what insects they attract you know butterflies come to them swallowtails solitary bees bumblebees and it also attracts uh predatory wasps and beetles now what's that right here elderberries I don't know if elderberries are awesome for the bees, but we have lots of elderberries and we definitely get a bumper crop because the bees pollinate these flowers, native bees, as well as the honeybees visit them. I've never walked up to a thicket of elderberry and had the sound of bees everywhere, but uh, we definitely benefit from having the apiary close by. Now, these are things that I plant. We're looking at sunflowers. These are dwarf sunflowers, so they grow just under waist height. And I have them in strips, of course, so that I can walk between them and see what bee species are on them. Of course, they get nectar and pollen from sunflowers. Sunflowers are a fantastic resource for all your bees and for your hives. On the left, we have our managed honeybee up at the top there with the large pollen pants that run down the full length of those hind legs. That's Melissa Dees. That is a native bee. So there's a chance to see the managed honeybee with native bees on the same flower. These grasshoppers, they're making more grasshoppers apparently. And I don't think they benefit from the flowers at all other than a staging area for their public display of affection here. So I just saw them there, so I thought I would share that with you. If I have to see them, you should see them. So moving right along to the next plant. Here we go, look at this one. Does that look like a bee? No, it's not a bee, it's a fly. It's a fly that mimics the bee colors. That's why it's called a mimic. And it only has two wings, where a honeybee, for example, has four wings. So it's easy to identify these flies, but it was opportune that this fly showed up on this sunflower so I could show it to you. Sunflowers really are composed of many individual flowers. And of course, this turns into sunflower seeds and the bees go around in circles and gather pollen. When you're looking for sunflower varieties, please make sure that you get those that are not listed as pollen free. This is a bumblebee. Of course, the honeybee in the foreground. Lots of bees share the same flowers, often at the same time as we saw before. You wanna make sure that when you're picking out your plants, sunflowers are annual, so you have to plant them every year. And uh, make sure that the seeds that you're getting, number one, they're going to have pollen. And number two, they don't have any kind of systemic pesticide like neonicotinoids built into them. There's more Joe Pye weed, a whole stand of it. So again, that's good stuff. Those are volunteers. They're just there all the time. So I have a mix of native plants to get together. This is hyssop. Now it's called giant hyssop. I know this one doesn't look very giant. This is a fantastic nectar plant for your bees. So hyssop grows forever basically, but you might have to plant it yourself. And I have a couple varieties of hyssop and these will grow tall. These are new this year for my landscape and we'll be able to split them as time goes by. But I wanted you to see it and know that all hyssop isn't the same. So there's anise hyssop and if you want to know what other varieties of hyssop there are, you can look them up. I've been growing the wrong variety for years, a really skinny anise hyssop, and this is giant hyssop. So it's different. And the giant hyssop supposedly is going to yield more. They say that an acre of this can support more than 20 colonies of bees. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that was in a write-up that I read, but it's definitely gonna be a strong nectar plant as time goes by. So another perennial, you plant them once and let them go. That's what I like. Of course, we have raspberries. We have red raspberries and black raspberries. We have them that grow wild. This happens to be cultivated and is in my raspberry patch. 
And here we have lots of pollinators zooming around. So the honeybees, of course, are taking care of pollinating these berries, as well as bumblebees, even wasps come to the flowers there. And uh, look how fat and red those raspberries are. So this is a really good patch. Great way, by the way, to observe your bees. And we're just at the leading edge of these large red raspberries today, August the 26th. So one of the reasons that it's great that I'm putting this video out is it's a record for myself. What was growing, what was blooming, what were the bees on? And also we can correlate that with how much weight the hives are gaining. If you've been watching my videos recently, this is also the beginning of swarm season. That's right, we have a late August, early September swarm season here, and that's just because all of these plants come into bloom, they provide all these resources, and the hives gain weight fast, and they get a sense that things are good in the environment, why not reproduce the entire colony by swarming out? And it's been my experience that that happens even if you expand the hive boxes, you put supers on, you give them more room, you do everything that you're supposed to do, but honeybees like to reproduce. So don't feel bad about it. The good news is we still have plenty of time the whole month of September for recovery. So there's a honeybee pollinating those raspberry blossoms. So good stuff. As soon as I show this video, of course, my grandkids are going to be out here eating these raspberries, I'm sure, because they didn't know that they were ripe enough to collect. We also have mulberries, so we have trees that have lots of flowers on them and things like that. I would not consider raspberries, if you're trying to plant them, just to provide for your bees. I don't think you're going to see a huge raspberry nectar flow, so you're not going to get like raspberry honey. Another thing people might want to know, because you have to label your honey, you have to put what it is that's on it. So I just say wildflower honey. We can't really narrow it to one species. We're looking at my layens hive here in the background. In the foreground, we have a great nectar and pollen plant. These flowers are known as cosmos. Cosmos are annuals and you have to plant them. I have fields of cosmos mixed with goldenrod and sunflowers. Obviously, the more flowers you have of any variety, the more appeal it's gonna have to the bees and the more bees and other pollinators will show up and visit those plants. And that's my long Langstroth hive in the background. It's going great guns right now, too. And some people might want to know, why did I put that here? Well, I plant flowers near the apiary, but it doesn't have to be. Honeybees can forage a couple of miles or more, even, if they need to find those resources. There's a bee. I don't think she's showing a lot of activity. She looks like she's goofing off a little, truth be known. There's a couple of bees there. The other one's sticking her tongue in and out just sitting and lounging on that Cosmo. Sometimes they spend the night there watching the sky, of course, because we have incoming rain. Big surprise. Now, this is a cool plant that I just started paying attention to actually today. So I had to pause and look that up on my phone real quick. It is called Meadow Napweed. And it's growing everywhere on its own. Again, it's a volunteer, nice and tall probably three or four feet in height and the honeybees are on it later I noticed so meadow napweed there's the purple plant now we're down in my lower meadow which is towards the west of my house and we have acres of sunflowers cosmos goldenrod maximilian sunflowers and I'm showing you a strip of sunflowers here lots of pollinators no big secret go there people like to stand in front of them and get their pictures taken of course we see bees all over these things now they're a great nectar and pollen source. The pollen has unknown qualities. And by that I mean they're bringing in pollen from sunflowers for the bee bread, of course, to take care of the brood and raise replacement bees. But it has medicinal qualities that we don't know the extent of. There may be some evidence that it actually helps with fowl brood inside the hive. So the quality and diversity of the pollen that you're getting is very important. Look at this honeybee down at the bottom of the sunflower here hanging on with her mandibles and her front legs while she organizes her pollen on her hind legs. Everywhere I turn, this piece of grass just moved in front of my camera. But anyway, it's very interesting. Sometimes they'll hover over the plant and they'll organize their pollen. Here's a very good distinction here with the Melissa Dees again, native bee. When you see the pollen on their hind legs, it runs the full length of the legs. So that's kind of a tell, that's a giveaway. 
Lots of cosmos through here. Fantastic to look at. You can just listen to all the bees buzzing around and this is not an optimal day for them to be foraging. Just like I said, rain is coming in. Cosmos can get pretty tall too, by the way. So you can be eye level up with them. They're, you could be four feet to six feet. I know they're not listed to be that high. And right in the front of this sunflower is ragweed. Sometimes you'll see ragweed. Uh, the bees will be there collecting pollen. They don't get nectar from it. Here's a close up of Melissa Dees again. Note the length of the pollen on the hind legs. Very different from a honeybee. Once you start seeing the differences, you'll be able to point this out to your friends and they're specialists. They go on sunflowers. So uh, Maximilian sunflowers also will be blooming here. I'm going to show you what those plants look like. They haven't started to bloom yet. But remember, we want a cascade of flowers going through the year so that there's no dearth period. So late season, when things start to cool off, getting into September and October, we have other plants that are going to be blooming and coming in. Also, the seeds from these sunflowers are food for the birds. We have goldfinches all over. I tried to get video of them. But they were dodging me going to other parts of the field when I was coming in close to video. Also, you might be wondering, do they show a preference? Now, this is, of course, the native bee. Do the honeybees show a preference to one sunflower over another? I haven't really noticed that. So the key is definitely how much pollen is being produced on that sunflower. Now, they're enticed by nectar as well. And the nectar produces a honey that is very light colored. So... Sunflower honey, but there again, uh, other things are flowering at the same time. Other bees are foraging, other species of flowers. Uh, each foraging group that goes out, they dedicate themselves on their foraging trip to one species of flower. And the other thing is, like this honeybee now on the cosmos, do they go to different colored cosmos blossoms? Sure do. That one's going from burgundy to white. This is a bumblebee, of course. And if you could look at this with ultraviolet light, you would see that the petals serve kind of as beacons uh, to show an ultraviolet spectrum exactly so the bee can find the center of the flower where all the pollen and nectar is located. So it's very interesting. It's not just um, pretty for people. Of course, they're designed as signposts to gather polliners, pollinators. There's a honeybee behind this. I'm trying to get, oh, no, it's a bumblebee. So Cosmos, you can't have enough of them. So here's the other thing. You can't have too many of them. These are going to bloom later. These are Maximilians. Maximilians can grow over six feet tall. This is a great border plant. It's a perennial. You don't have to plant them every year like you do the Cosmos and the sunflowers. So once you set up a patch of Maximilian sunflowers, when these start blooming, they bloom right into October. They'll be a late season pollen and nectar source for your bees. So if you've got an area that you don't mind if they grow or you're trying to create a privacy screen or something like that between you and your neighbors, that's it. The more of any plant that you put out there, if it's got pollen and nectar for the bees, the more bees you can expect to show up because they like to go where there's large clusters. So if you can plant 100, do 100. If you can do 1,000, better. If you can do 100,000 or more, even better. So think in acres. If you've got friends who've got property that they don't necessarily develop or they're mowing all the time. Maybe you can talk them out of mowing it and get into planting perennials. And that way they can start fresh every year, change their mind if they want to. Cosmos are not native, but they are a heavy nectar source for the bees. High sugar content. And as I mentioned before, the bees go from a variety of different flower colors here. It's the same. They're all cosmos. So I can't say that they prefer one color over another. They go on the white blossoms, burgundy, pink, red, doesn't seem to matter. Yellow seems to be really loaded with pollen, but I don't see a lot of bees on the yellow. And uh, you'll learn more just looking at the area. What kind of soil do you need to grow them in? Well, these grow in clay soil. Clay soil is deficient. So I found that these did really well where the topsoil was kind of thin. I also never water them. The, everything is growing just on its own. Well, there I blew it. I said they don't go for the orange ones very much, and there was a honeybee right on it. So 
They go for what they go for. What kind of bug is that right there? That's right. That's a firefly. Most people don't see them in the daytime, but they, they're capable of bioluminescence. That's why everybody loves them. And if you look at the very end of its abdomen there, that's the part that twinkles at night and that glows. Another bumblebee on a white cosmos. The coolest thing about having diversity on your property is that you can walk around and see all the different pollinators that are present. This is a honeybee, of course. Tried to take off, but had its foot caught and did an awkward move there. Also, you can tell how old your foragers are when you start looking at the edges of their wings. This one's got pollen packs on its corbicula. Notice, you'll never see pollen packed on just one hind leg. They balance it out. So they add pollen to both legs equally. That way they're balanced in flight. And of course they're towards the back, the hind legs, and they're gonna bring that back just in time to feed developing new brood right now. What's this plant right here? Another native, these are asters. Asters are another fantastic nectar plant for your bees. A lot of people don't like aster honey because again, the flavor is really strong. So fall honey here is much stronger and darker than the spring and summer honey that we get. So right now, because of the asters, goldenrod, when that kicks in, that's gonna make a stronger flavored honey. Some people really love strong flavor, I do. And uh, asters take care of that. Again, they're perennial, they come up on their own year after year, just let them grow and they do their thing. So in the asters, you can see lots of them have not blossomed yet, so they're just getting started and the bees aren't paying a lot of attention to them yet. But when they show up in large quantities, the bees will pay attention to the asters. And these grow several feet tall also. This one though is probably just a couple of feet off the ground. Now I could have shown you milkweeds. Milkweeds are a fantastic source for your bees, but we're going with what's happening right now today. And the milkweeds are done. These are milkweed pods. And I know you're looking at these pods thinking that's really odd. I wonder what that looks like on the inside maybe. And so later, these what you see when they dry out and they pop open on their own and they spread their seeds all over the landscape. So milkweeds spread themselves, perennial, and they spread through their root systems on their own, but they also spread by seed. And I'm not sure which birds would eat the seeds, but uh, milkweed, when they're in blossom, fantastic, heavy nectar resource for your bees again. So this is something else you don't have to plant, but you certainly can. And I have planted several varieties of milkweed. My favorite would be swamp milkweed. They bloom a little longer, so the nectar is available longer. These leaves are chewed. No great secret that monarch butterflies need milkweeds exclusively to raise their young. So monarch caterpillars were on these earlier in the year. And we've had quite a few monarchs this year, but I don't know what the overall count is. I know that monarchs are challenged and uh, we definitely want to keep milkweeds in the environment for the bees and for other pollinators like monarchs. Now I pulled one of the pods off so you can see why it's called milkweed. That's it, look at that milky substance right there. Anytime you break the milkweed apart, you get this milky discharge. Guess what, it's really sticky too. And this pod is not ready to break apart on its own, so I broke it apart for you to show you what's inside. Now those seeds will turn a dark tan, and uh, we've got the protective shield there of the pod to cover it while it uh, develops the seeds. And then later when they pop on and open on their own, they look like little puffs of cotton. Most people have seen them. It's a lot of fun for kids. I tell the kids to pull them open, spread them out and blow them into the air and see how far they fly and milkweed pods, milkweed seeds go everywhere. The pods just stay there. And they're great texture for kids that like to have something to catch a hold of and learn about. Queen Anne's Lace. Now I don't know that the honeybees care much about Queen Anne's Lace, although on rare occasion I've seen them land on them. Why is it called Queen Anne's Lace? Look at the dark spot right here in the middle. The legend is that Queen Anne was doing needlepoint and poked her finger with the needle and a drop of blood fell in the center of her lace work. And so we have this dark, often burgundy, sometimes red, tiny flower, dead center. And that's the legend of Queen Anne's lace. So again, native comes back year after year. Here's one that's not yet bloomed. So they're all curled up. Plenty of Queen Anne's lace going on out there. And we do see pollinators, sometimes flies are on it, like that mimic bee fly that was out there. 
they go on Queen Anne's Lace. So there is some nectar there. And depending on which variety it is, it might actually be a heavy nectar flow. This is thistle. Now, most of the thistle has gone by by now, so I had to look around to find one that still had some color in it. Honeybees do go on the thistle, so there's lots of nectar there. And again, just like anything else, um, I let thistle grow along the fence row. So you see the woven wire fence in the background here? Because uh, I don't mow through there, and I'm not that worried about people getting, you know, prickle burrs on their clothes. And maybe that'll stick to your dog's hair and things like that. That's how they spread their seeds, of course. They get caught on the hides of animals and spread around. You can see they have those little hooks on the end of their points there, like Velcro. It grabs onto your sweaters, your pants, your socks. And these things grow tall. So these are four feet tall on average. And they come back year after year. Some people don't like thistles. Uh, birds come back for the seeds after they're fully developed, and that's how they get spread. This is an interesting plant too. This is called American pokeweed. This stuff grows tall. This is over five feet tall and it's along the fence row. I don't know that much about pokeweed. I know that it has these flowers all over it and they turn into these dark purplish berries. And uh, that's about it. I can't tell you much about the plant other than it comes in, shows up on its own. And uh, who knows what that's about. I've never seen bees on it. Uh, I know that these things are big and they're obnoxious looking. If you know something about pokeweed, maybe you could share it down in the comments section. So now we're back on another um, species of goldenrod and the bees are on it. Why? Well, because it's drying out finally. It's been out here so long that the dew has dried off of the flowers and the bees are now back on them. So again, fantastic nectar flow. The more goldenrod you can grow, fields of it, if you can do it. Uh, in fact, I clear goldenrod so that I can plant the sunflowers and things like that. I also know that the modern movement is, if you care about the environment, of course, uh, try to do no-till. Uh, that's kind of difficult, I know, but when you plant sunflowers and things like that, they have a lot of competition. Leaving fence rows wild, so here's the corner of a fence uh, for a two and a half acre field. And there are, you know, there's goldenrod, there's queen anne's lace, there are thistles, there are all kinds of berries. And uh, I like to leave fence rows. If farmers could do that and leave maybe a tenth of their land to go wild, then you would find out that uh, pollinators might bounce back a little bit. And honeybees could definitely do what they want to do on these flowers. So again, native flowers. Fun to see those nice and tall. Also walked past my solitary bee houses here. And wouldn't you know, look at this little wasp. Beneficial wasp, by the way. This is where mason bees and other solitary bees are locking their young in. And that's why you see the ends plugged with mud. And that's why they're called mason bees. Because just like little masons, they pack things in there. And that means their larvae is packed in there often with pollen. You can see the percentage that was successful and that they're packed in and plugged up. And in the spring, you'll see tiny holes and they'll hatch out, usually in correlation with the bloom of whatever plant they're designed to pollinate. So, for example, apple and uh, pear tree blossoming, there are orchard bees that come out just at the right time to do that. And there is a movement, of course, to have resident pollinator houses, nesting sites like this in um, orchards so that these bees, the native bees, can come out and pollinate them instead of honeybees. And they're more efficient than honeybees one by one, but the honeybees beat out these solitary pollinators by sheer numbers. So guess what this is? Catnip. So catnip gets a lot of bees on it, just not generally honeybees, and we know it has a strong scent to it. It would be interesting to find out what catnip honey might be like, but uh, we just have it here. I think it's in the mint family and uh, the honeybees don't go on it. We always find big fat bumblebees, bombus, and my wife grows these along the side of the garage. And I just thought I'd show it to you just in case you're trying to identify plants around your property. Perennial comes back on its own, spreads on its own and uh, requires no maintenance, no watering, nothing like that. Of course, where we live, we generally get plenty of water, even though we're in a water deficit right now. But that's catnip. 
Here we are, good old Joe Pie weed. Warming up, honeybees are on it. Look at the white pollen packs there. So also, this is another reason why you want to walk around, see what your bees are doing and see what they're on. Now that we see the color of the pollen that they're getting from Joe Pie weed, we'll notice that that's the source when they head back to the hive. Now here we are. This is self-heal. We looked at it earlier, but things have dried out now and the honeybees are on it. So this is a medicinal plant. A lot of people like to assign medicinal properties from these plants based on their nectar and everything to the bees that collect it. I don't know of any known health benefit that the bees get from collecting from medicinal plants, but it certainly can't hurt. Uh, the nectar also may not be very abundant. How do we know? Because it depends on how much time you see each honeybee spending on each blossom. Sorry about the out of focus here. I was trying to track this bee around on the ground. And uh, these tiny flowers, they're getting nectar from it, but they have to visit lots of them. The good news is it's like a ground cover. Perennial spreads out on its own. It would not bother me at all if half my lawn were nothing but self-heal. And that's because you don't have to mow the yard. Every time I mow the yard, I feel bad. The other thing is you don't want to mow over all your pollinators, so try to mow late in the day if you can, especially in the summertime when most of the bees are back at their hives. Here we are back on the clover. We looked at clover at the beginning, but the bees weren't on it. Now they're moving in groups to patches of clover all over the lawn. And every time you mow late in the day again, then uh, new flowers come up and that gives the bees fresh blossoms to go to. So letting it just go to seed might be great for forage, but it's uh, better for the bees if you can mow it. And of course, closing things out here, the rain came, storms are coming in, of course, but I'm glad I had an opportunity to walk around before the rain hit and share with you a little bit about the nectar and pollen resources on my property. Thanks for watching.